it's a life, you know? It's not, not a good life, but it's a life, you know? I'm gonna kill a rat. We're talking about, in some cases, the worst environment on the face of this earth. Tonight on 48 Hours. Got the boom, 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 boom. If you think New York is crazy. Show your tongue. Terrifying. Mom, let me see your tongue. Wait till you see what's at the core. This is one of the easiest places to survive. Of the Big Apple. Something romantic, mysterious, fantastic. It's a teeming metropolis. Uh, we're rerouting trains right now due to uh, the smoke in the fire department needing the power off. Underground. 30 to 60,000 people right now are being affected. This is a mess. From the creative. I had always wanted to paint something here. To the curious. Bernard, it's Jennifer. To the cutting edge. My window opportunity. You never know what lurks. It's alive. Under the apple. I got basically all the comforts of home. I got stereo, television, radio. It was yeah. all this kind of dirt you dug out? About 100 cubic yards by hand. I'd like to be in prison with you someday. Here, what happens below is as surprising as what happens above. So, come along with us as we head straight down and get ready. It's another day in Brooklyn. And like most every day... Watch the cars. Bob Diamond is about to check on his property. He's got to get the rest of the cones. But if real estate is location, 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 then the land that Diamond has mined is decidedly below grade. In fact, it's below everything. This is the entrance to your world, eh? Well, this is the entrance to the 19th century in its original state. Really? Original? Original. Hasn't been touched? Hasn't been touched since 1861. Doesn't look great. Let's go. There's no graceful way to do this, is there? Kind of just sit on the edge and drop yourself in. Great, great advice. This whole area was filled in up to about here, and uh, we dug all of this out. And you this dug all, I mean, dug this all this, this, it was yeah. all this kind of dirt you dug out? About 100 cubic yards by hand. <laughs> I'd like to be in prison with you someday. Yeah. It was a lot of work, but he finally broke through to this the first subway tunnel ever built in the world. I had just seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, and when they opened up the, uh, the first Egyptian tomb, a blast of cold air came out from the other side, and this did the same exact thing. And that's when I knew for sure something was on the other side. What did you say when you knocked through that thing? And well, saw? I was laughing my head off for about a half hour because everyone thought that there was no such place. Well, how old is this tunnel that we're standing in now? When was it built? 1844. So 1844. 1844. Before the Civil War. Way before the Way Civil before. War. This is the oldest existing railroad structure in the United States in its original state. Diamond first heard about the tunnel when it was mentioned on a radio talk show. CBSA. And he hunted it down using 150-year-old maps. That was sort of like following a treasure map. But what began 14 years ago as a research project has today become diamond's career yeah, sort of absorbs you you know you start doing a little bit and it gets more interesting and it pulls you in deeper and you do more and, and it wasn't only bob diamond who got drawn in i thought it was marvelous it was also his mother marvelous. elsa diamond and i said what would you like to see done with this tunnel he said he wanted to restore it to what it had been she took up her son's cause in the way only a mother could and i said i'm gonna help you do it and so what did you do <laughs> publicity you got an article in the Daily News. News, the Post, the uh, New York Times, uh, Staten Island. How, um, many, uh, how many articles do you think you've gotten in the newspaper about your son? You know, I've never counted them. Fifty? More. Seventy-five? More. A hundred? Hundred? Mm-hmm. Over... It was a National Geographic magazine, the New Yorker magazine. No one has ever taken a tunnel. <laughs> right? A tunnel? and made it into something romantic, mysterious, and fantastic. But romance, mystery, and fantasy, just like beauty, is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. So I'm looking around here, and I'm, I, I see a, a, a dirty old tunnel. I, 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 I know I say this at great risk. Okay. Filled with junk. Okay? <laughs> what, do you, what do you see? Well, I see a national landmark. Come on. For real. 
It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Along with, I don't no, know, Lincoln this is, Memorial and along all, with the all, Lincoln, all those that's places? That's absolutely correct. This is a historical place? Correct. After much finagling, Diamond managed to get a franchise to operate this tunnel as an honest-to-God Brooklyn tourist attraction. New York City commuters fret about having to spend hours underground. They've got nothing on Joey. Been down here like three years. It's a life, you know? It's not, not a good life, but it's a life, you know? It is not a life the typical above-ground New Yorker knows anything about. Clark, it's heavy after a while. Days spent out of sight in the dark maze of tunnels beneath Manhattan's west side. My friends brought me down here. I was to sleep in the park in a cardboard box, you know? And they told me, you know, that I deserve a little better life for myself. Joey, no last name or face allowed, came to New York from the South. He was 15. I've been here like about eight years. And I found up here, you know, without a job, without any, any high school education. This is one of the easiest places to survive. Rough estimates are that 5,000 people live in the tunnels below New York City. They do not, however, consider themselves homeless. Houseless, maybe, but for them, the tunnels really are home. For Joey, houseless doesn't even really apply. Past the family pets. Ladybug. On the second floor, he lives with his girlfriend. I believe I've lost the keys to my house. There it is. This is home. And it's filled with found objects left in the trash by his fellow New Yorkers. I got basically all the comforts of home. I got stereo, television, radio, stove to cook on just like anybody else. I go out every day and pick up bottles and cans off the streets and make like $40, $50 a day for myself. Eat steak for dinner. You know, like tonight I'm having spaghetti, you know. There are a handful of others down here who seem just as well organized. Manuel doesn't want his face shown either. His family doesn't know his house is far underground. People come on, come on, come on. Don't my worry about are, the shoes. My Don't shoes worry. are dirty. Don't worry about them. Come on. All right. So I got a washing machine. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> come on. Does this work? Yeah, it works. You're <laughs> kidding. No, I'm not Where kidding. do you get water? I, I fill it up with buckets. Manuel has been here a year and lives off food stamps. We're not the type of people where we could go to work every day. I have a lot of jobs, but it's like I can't hold a job. And, uh, why, I don't know. I just can't deal with society. Now you might think this would make a great book. Jennifer Toth thought so too. She wrote The Mole People while a grad student at Columbia University. Hello? I went down there? Jennifer gave us a tour of the New York tunnels. James has been down there about three years. He basically takes care of people down there, particularly women who go down there and don't have a place to stay. To help one another steer clear of people like James, track workers use a special code. They scrawl orange spray paint on the rocks or on whatever there is, and it says chud. That's their slang for the people living in Grant. Chud comes from this 1984 horror flick. Help! Help! Short for cannibalistic humanoid underground dweller. <laughs> A chud, all right? The movie left no doubt that things beneath this city are better left alone. Bernard! Reality is quite different. Bernard! It's Jennifer! Bernard, self described Lord of the Tunnel, is a main character in Jennifer's book. Where do you want me to meet you? Did you get close to any of these people? Oh, very close. Very close. And it's hard not to. Here's Bernard. <laughs> Bernard. Just do not stick him in front of the camera, are you? You look great. Bernard is a very warm person. I mean, he's very, uh, he's very articulate. He can be pretty tough when he feels like he needs to be. Bernard just walks the tunnels and he looks out for people. Bernard has been here eight years. And although Julia Child might not approve. This is the kitchen, if you prefer to it. This is the grill and... You cook? Uh, marvelously. I'm an exquisite cook. <laughs> I've perfected it. I have all the spices, seven, eight boxes of herbal teas over here. Bernard prides himself on taking no government assistance. He also makes money collecting cans. And believe it or not, he says he could have a six-figure movie deal soon. An unexpected bonus from the book. You're a media star. You're not... 
whatever a star is, I mean, we are truly uh, living. You like this, though, right? It doesn't bother me. I think people, it's mind-boggling that people find this existence so fascinating. I mean, what's fascinating is that I can't be at peace. I mean. Not that he turns down requests for interviews. How many times have you been interviewed, do you know? Oh, my God. Let me think. WR, CBS, CNN, Sally Jesse Raphael Show, BBC, Global Brazilian Television. Given the din, the dirt, and the dark, the reporters have only one real question. Why are most people down here? Uh, basically, uh, fear. Fear of uh, conforming to the things that man has programmed. People are very insecure in this life, and this is a, an environment for one to one can strengthen oneself. For Jennifer, it was a frightening environment. I was always scared, you know, what would happen, what could happen. There are other tunnels where they're a lot more dangerous. Um, there are very loose affiliations of people. Sometimes they're even hostile with one another. Are there are there many women down here? There are a lot of women who are uh, down here with men. Most of them are with men. It's too dangerous to be alone down here, I think. Um, there's a lot of uh, assault, or a lot of rape, a lot of abuse, and most of the women that I've seen are pretty bad off. In the three years it took to do the book, Jennifer also met kids, runaways, and even a few families. If you had to pinpoint a common characteristic of people who are down here, what would it be? I think most of them are trying to escape something and they want their freedom as well. Most people in the back of their minds think that I'm, I'm really, in reality, running from something. You're not? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> what? I fantasize, even I'm haunted in dreams about my return to functional society because I've developed a very low tolerance for chaos. You'll never go back. I will. I plan to. Really? Very soon. Uh, my release is due very soon. Do you think he'll ever leave? I hope so. so I hope so. You I hope so. He's got a lot to offer. I think he could do very well. So this is your gallery. This is where my paintings are. Chris Pape paints 30 feet underground. I was at one point going to have an opening down here, but I thought that if we had wine and cheese set out, that the rats would jump all over the cheese and people would freak out and run. Kind of give us a tour of what's down here, what you've done. The 33-year-old artist's works appear under five city blocks. Tell me about this. The concept was just to make the two torsos work together. Tell me about this one. This piece in particular is taken from a photo by Margaret Burke White that was done uh, during the Great Floods. It's about taking an image that was, to me, very symbolic of the Depression and putting it in a new context. Why did you choose this space for this? Um, I had always wanted to paint something here. It's Chris's spray paint version of Goya's The Third of May and a gift to a friend. It's Bernard's space. I've spent a lot of time here with Bernard. Um, it's Bernard's living room. It's Bernard's <laughs> living room is what it is. That's Bernard, as in media star. You got it, guy. And Lord of the Tunnel. What's the hardest part about working down here? You're left to your own devices. I mean, right now we don't have a ladder, so I can't paint. A man without a ladder. <laughs> in the tunnel, invention is the mother of creativity. Is it possible to use that skid there? Yeah, you could use this as a ladder. Today, <laughs> Chris is painting a portrait of Bernard. That's good. See, because that's how I've got to paint you. That's the right profile. I'm going to try and sketch it real quick with silver. I only use silver and black more because it seems to work. It has its own expressive quality, which is good. Chris studied at New York's School of Visual Arts. I sat here and, and did my thesis for school. But not all his training's been in the classroom. I became involved in, in the graffiti movement. He got his artistic start 20 years ago. I wanted some recognition from my peers, and a way of doing it was uh, was to write my name on trains. It wasn't just your name on the train. It meant that the night before, you had A, snuck out of your house, B, 
gone up to some godforsaken neighborhood, C, run down the tracks, D, confronted possibly gangs, police, 675 volts going through the third rail. It was this wonderful machismo type of thing, which at that, at that age is very appealing. Train painting actually came in handy. You would paint your name on the train like that. So, and that, and you couldn't back up because there was another train right there. That's how I learned spatial relationships. Some people go to school for it. His graffiti tag was freedom in the old days. When his work made the local news. And though he considers himself above graffiti now. Some of the later paintings become more powerful because they're more well thought out. He's painted a tribute to the old days. This is you. That was me, yes. I lived in that jacket. That was my bombardier's jacket. I got that jacket on, I think, my 16th birthday. It's, it's an homage to my jacket. And then the spray can head, of course, with his, was appropriate at the time. Below ground, Chris Pape may be well known. Up here, he's hardly a household word. Although hundreds of people go within just a few feet of his paintings every single day. If only they knew where to look. The whole idea was that you would look through the grating up above and you say, whoa, there's this painting. It drips down through the grating and then it's like invading their space. Just to But if Chris encourages people to look... Uh, it's always been one of my favorite paintings down here. He does not encourage them to touch. You have no compunction about painting over this? None at all. Because? He shouldn't be painting here. An outlaw artist has had the nerve to paint over some of Chris's works. Certainly annoys me. It, it, it breaks my heart. It couldn't be restored. Did so. you write, I can't forgive this? Yes, I did. Well, this is another that you had to come back and fix. Oh, yeah. You look at the, the, that line there. I, I would hope that people would just give me my space. And if he has his space, he only needs a little time. Wow. After just 15 minutes... I think you did it. I think yeah. you got it. It looks like him. Bernard's portrait is done. The problem, if you will, with this is you can't take this canvas and move it and try it in some other location and let somebody hang it in his living room. Yeah, that's a problem. Kills you when you want to make a living. I would love to make a lot of money. I would love to have been one of those really successful painters. And it just didn't happen. You know, I wound up stuck in a freight car. There's underground. Step to the side. Head up off first, please. And then... There's underground. And the conductor of this underground... ...is Larry T. If somebody says, who's Larry T? Yeah? What's he all about? Mm -hmm. What's the answer? He's a superstar songwriter, performer. Got the boom, 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 boom. DJ. And now back to Larry T. Trendsetter. If I'm into like uh, working a uh, a pimp daddy look, you know, I'll just throw on a, a fierce hat like this. Why do you call it underground? Because it's not mainstream yet. A lot of what's happening here in fashion and music comes out of here first and then kind of gets distributed through the rest of the country. What's this ring in the eyebrow business? Yeah, you like it? Huh? Well, I didn't say I liked it. I you just asked what like it was. The piercings are really in right now. Show your tongue. It's terrifying. Come on, let me see your tongue. People want attention. They need huh? attention. They live for attention. They want somebody to notice them and say, <gasps> My window opportunity. Halloween every day to a lot of them. And everyone needs a costume. Well, I'll go with the glamorous. Stick uh, with the things that brought you to the dance, if huh? If you got something that uh, works, you stick with it, you know what I mean? And you know what I feel like? What? Crazy pimp daddy sportswear. So, uh, Mr. Fashion Plate here, uh, yeah. uh, shoes now. Well, let's get something big. Yeah, you just went up about eight feet. Yeah. So, uh, oh, I think we've got Speed Racer. Yeah. <laughs> Who are we now? Speed Racer? Speed Racer. Evil Knievel, maybe? Mm. On a bad day? Maybe. <laughs> when they uh, see me in my nice blue laser tonight, what are they going to think? They'll rush you in the club. They'll think you have some money. 
the so, music's like uh, a loud. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is loud, definitely. How can you judge whether it's a good night or not? How? A lot of people watching this on television are going to say, uh, what in the world is this country coming to? Right. I think compared to the excesses of the 70s, this is more of a voyeuristic kind of thing. It's not so much about really doing it this time around, especially the sex. It's more about dressing up and showing off. Listen, if this is the worst we can show for our country, if this is the most scandalous, the low rentist, then I say, oh, well, then, you know, what do you got to worry about? <laughs> and now for something completely different. Tonight, the de Blasio administration is pushing back after a report critical of its anti-graffiti efforts. We're following this story live at 6 tonight. Our Tony Aiello in Long Island City with more on this. Tony? Dana, the de Blasio administration understandably sensitive to complaints that quality of life has diminished on his watch, and graffiti certainly a major quality of life concern. Now there's a new report out that says the time between the city receiving a graffiti complaint and cleaning up the graffiti has increased substantially. It's impossible to imagine New York City without graffiti, but many residents would prefer much less of it. I don't like that. I don't, like, I don't like that. Nobody's paying attention to anything anymore. Even when they call, they take too long to show up. Indeed, a new report is critical of response times for the Graffiti Free NYC program. City workers use solvent to dissolve and power spray to wash away graffiti. Three years ago, the average time between complaint and cleanup was 67 days. Last year, that grew to 114 days. Far too long for critics, including State Senator Tony Avella. The whole way to address graffiti is to paint over it or remove it immediately. You've got to go immediately. So that's totally unacceptable. It defeats the whole purpose of the program. The Independent Budget Office report says it appears frustrated building owners and neighbors are taking matters into their own hands. In 2011, 84% of graffiti complaints resulted in graffiti removal. But last year, that number dropped to 62%. Increasingly, when crews show up to paint over the graffiti, they find someone else has already done it. Graffiti Free NYC is run by the city's Economic Development Corporation. Anthony Hogarby is chief spokesman. The report says that wait times now top 100 days. Is that acceptable? It's not the most accurate way to look at how effective the program has been to look at those average response times. The EDC says graffiti removal teams cleaned up 6 million square feet last year compared to 4.3 million in 2014. They blame the increase in response times on graffiti in difficult to reach places. Those complaints can sit in the system for years. The city says the number of graffiti complaints received through the 311 system actually declined between 2011 and 2015, and the mayor's office is promising record funding for the graffiti free NYC program in the next fiscal year. Live in Long Island City, Tony Aiello, CBS 2 News. Thank you, Tony.